Gravitonas is my top priority. I love working with Andreas and Ben and Henrik, my co-producer, and we're such a great team. And we write for other artists too now, but at the end of the day, Gravitonas is my, my love right now. And um, the way we're doing it is that we probably, we are, well, the journalists called Gravitonas the world's first Spotify band. But, and I think it's a correct description. We refuse to release albums. We refuse basically to go the traditional first a single, then an album, then a tour thing, which um, is very boring now. You know, now when the music bloggers are taking over the music industry, then there's nothing more boring to write about. There's a single out and there's a video with a single, then comes the album, then comes the tour because it's such a predictable process. And, and um, we're all tired of that now because what the new space opens up is, is completely new ways of doing music. And the format we're working with in Gravitonas that fits us perfectly, fits our kind of creativity, and the fans love it, is the fact that we release up to three EPs a year. The EP is wonderful for music blogs because it, it gives you four to six songs at a time to make comments on, which is just perfect. It's not too long like an album, but it's not too short like a single. And it also leaves room for the artist to express things that aren't normally found in the straightforward radio-friendly hit singles, but rather, you know, the more experimental stuff, you can put that out, you can put out collaborations. Uh, our next EP comes out in October. We're going to have our first two rap tracks on that one with a, a rapper signed to Sony in the States who worked with Gravitonas and loved, loved working with us. And, you know, you can, you can do all kinds of interesting, fun collaborations. So the EP format, I think, is the future. It, it really fits the new streaming environment wonderfully. Because the streaming environment is all about music blogs and it's about making your own playlists and then sharing them with your friends. And that's where you want, you know, mixing different artists, different genres, taking one song there, taking another song there. That's how you put these playlists together. And I think Gravitonas is, is perfectly gelled for that. And of course, we love to perform live. We have a whole five man band live setting. Made our first five man band performance at the opening of Stockholm Pride in, in Stockholm this summer. It was a great success. It was our first ever concert in Sweden. And um, we'd love to develop that more. But, um, you know, it, it's not the traditional band stuff that fascinates me and Andreas the most. What fascinates us the most is the creation of great music and then putting it out there in a brand new way because of all the new things you can do online you couldn't do before. Obviously, the connection between gay culture and dance music is, is a fundamental one that should always be respected, you know. Disco is to gay people what reggae is to Jamaicans, you know, and what, what punk is to amphetamine addicts, basically. It's, it's, a, it's a music genre that was developed by black gay men in America, and we all owe everything to them. Dance music started with disco in the 1970s, and, and we owe it to the black gay guys in America who, who turned soul music into an art form on the dance floor. So I, I always refer back to that. I'm very proud of being bisexual, and I think that I call myself gay to, because just like Barack Obama is half white and half black, but he's still black. Because you always have to be, you have to show your solidarity with a minority. And for me, I'm a gay man, and it's very important for me to stress that. And I'm a gay man in a business that's still controlled and ruled by straight men. And uh, I think it's important that we defend the gay cultural heritage of dance music. So even if all the guys the Swedish House Mafia are straight, and even if the straight men are dominating dance music too, we need to constantly remind them of the fact that this, this type of music has gay roots. And I'm very proud of that. And I think it's something very interesting because the American dance music scene uh, uh, always was more pro-gay than the European one. And I think it's important that it stays that way and that it, it reclaims, constantly reclaims that heritage. Because dance music started in America was exported to Europe, and it was developed in Europe in the 1970s and forward. And it's been jumping back and forth over the pond ever since then. But I am, knowing pop culture history, I'm forever grateful to America for creating disco music, because disco is where it all started, and disco is what, what it heralds back to, and what we have to refer back to all the time. So those are my roots, too. I think we should openly talk about it. You know, when Barack Obama says, gay marriage, okay, the time has come. And... Uh, if I can be at the forefront of that, then fine. Then, then if there's something I can contribute with. You know, at the end of the day, if somebody would tell me at a record company, if you hide your, your uh, bisexuality, Alexander, we can put this record in the top 40. I would say no right away. 
and I'm, I'm, st I'm still one of the most successful artists ever in Russia, probably today known as one of the most homophobic countries on the planet. But that's exactly because the people who are tired of homophobia in Russia take sides with people like me. That's exactly why I became a hero in Russia. And I think the payback you get as an open to gay artist at the end of the day, being proud of yourself and being able to move things forward. Think of Elton John. Think of the amazing thing he did before he came out, but what he, he's done even more after he came out. You know, he's the single biggest contributor to AIDS research on the planet. He's still with it. I'm so impressed with Elton John. He, he just launched a new record label in the UK. He's still better than anybody else, else at finding new and develop new talent, you know, than anybody else around. And he's totally proud of being an open to gay man today. And I think he, we should just look at him and then realize that that's where we should be with everything. And I've been in these A&R meetings so many times where a well-meaning young straight guy who's the head of A&R at the company thinks he's put the whole remix package together and everything's set and ready and he presents it for me. And he says, what do you think of this? I've got this guy on board and I've got this guy on board and now we can go with the single. And I started looking at it and say, hey, I will never put out a record unless there's the remix on this release that's perfectly suited for the gay dance floor. There's got to be at least one remix that has the gay dance floor in mind on every record that I put out, regardless of artist. And that's, that's, where I, that's what I always make sure. I always make sure that I'm grounded there in anything I do. And by God, you know, I, I tell all the gay men who love to go get up on the dance floor out there, if I do something you disapprove, oh, please tell me because then I know I'm wrong. You know, then I know I'm wrong. Then, 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 then what I'm doing is not develop music further. I'm not expanding the horizon. But if you lose your foundation in what you do, you really lost it. You, have, you always have to have a foundation to build from, to expand from. And to me, that's the gay guy on the dance floor. That's always the guy I refer to. He's my hero. In America, you have the constant struggle because you have this constant antagonism. You're constantly being reminded of the fact that, you know, one out of three people in America believe in the creation, creation myth from the Bible. And they honestly believe that homosexuality is against God's will or whatever. So you have this fight with these people all the time. But you can also live in cities where you ev never run into a single homophobic person. And, in, you know, the kind of ghettos that were created by gay people in the 1970s are still around and they're bigger and they're more important than ever and you find them in Toronto and San Francisco and New York and all these places. And um, you can have a very comfortable life there but you constantly have to fight with these groups out there that still deny you the right to have a gay marriage and things like that, which is of course very sad. Now the thing with Scandinavia is that homosexuality is not the slightest bit controversial. Gay marriage has been around forever. Um, the younger generation here don't care what sexual orientation you have, they find me and they're totally over it. Men and women go to bed whatever they like, both genders, and, and you know, it's an environment where that's a, really is quickly becoming a non-issue. Which is of course the goal, at the end of the day we should all be sexually liberated in the sense that we can go to bed with whoever we like and nobody should care. So that, that's, that's after all the goal. But sometimes, you know, you can sit in Scandinavia and you can, you can think, well, you know, we have the equality now here and it's no longer an issue, but hey, what happened to the energy? The energy you got from those fights, the, that antagonism all the time. And uh, I can sometimes envy people who live within the gay or the queer culture in, in America because there's an energy, having an enemy out there who's on TV all the time reminding you that you're a sinner against God, you know, it's gives you an enormous amount of energy that sometimes can be lacking in a really tolerant place like Scandinavia. So I think that's, that's how you need to compare gay culture in Scandinavia with gay culture in, in, in the U.S. In the U.S. it's still, still very much an issue, but that can also be a motor of creativity, whereas in Scandinavia it's become a non-issue. So, you know, you have to find inspiration somewhere else. Um, you know, being an openly gay artist in Scandinavia is just like, whoa, I don't care. You know, are you a good singer or not? Do you have a great song or not? You know, it's, it's, it's the immediate question you get if you're open again, so nobody really cares. I honestly really think we need bands and performers back on stage again. I think we have a huge DJ fatigue. But the DJ, as a DJ, is going to be more important, bigger than ever. 
And I even think the job of the DJ is going to be even more democratic because of streaming and all that. A lot of people who are really clumsy te technically can be really good DJs because they have great taste in the future. So I think there will be more DJs than ever before. Dance music will be bigger than it ever was. The four on the floor is bigger than it ever was, and it will be for a long time to come. But I think the merger of the DJ and the rock band is the way forward for the music industry. It's going to be a lot more captivating to go and watch than just a DJ performing or a really boring rock band still playing old rock and roll the old way. And I think the merger of the two is where we're at. And I, we hope to be at the forefront of that movement with Gravitonas. I think that's where things are going to be at for the next five to ten years.